Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, reading in Christ's name. Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened up his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. So as I said earlier, today is All Saints Day where we just celebrate all of those who went before us. We, of course, celebrate the apostles of the church, uh, all of the early church fathers, because for many years it was illegal uh, to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And there were many people who gave their lives for the sake of proclaiming the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Even today, we have missionaries all around the world that are in uh, countries that it's where it's illegal to be a Christian, and they have their lives kind of on the line, again, as they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's kind of a reminder that this is a message that's worth dying for. It is a message that needs to be proclaimed in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of uncomfortable circumstances. And so as we praise God for those who went before us, those who left a legacy and that proclaims Christ and inspires us to, to, to live a life that really proclaims Christ with and without words, I can't think of a better uh, gospel lesson than looking at the Beatitudes, uh, these nine wonderful statements of Christ as he begins the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. These verses reveal a lot about salvation about living a life that glorifies Christ as well as what's in store for those who follow Christ in this life, but also in the one to come. I think my biggest prayer is that even as we mourn the loss of our dear sister Phyllis, that we too would be encouraged because for a Christian, I've said this before, it's never goodbye. It's always I'll see you later. The salvation that we have in Christ Jesus and the promise of eternal life is what brings true hope and true peace in the midst of a sinful and fallen world. May we be encouraged through the words of Jesus Christ. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text, and I thank you for these words of Christ that have been preserved in your holy word. Uh, may they instruct us, inspire us, and preserve us in the one true faith. Lord, I do pray that every single word that proceeds from my mouth would be from you and not from me. I pray that it's in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word, and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all of this in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. And so the very first thing that we see in this wonderful text of ours is that Jesus describes the characteristics of someone who can be saved. Jesus describes the characteristics of someone who can be saved. Now, of course, we have the waters of baptism, so this is kind of addressing adults kind of more so than it would children, but there is an aspect of continuing in the faith that's given to us through the waters of baptism, and that really reminds us of what we are to cultivate in our heart. But as he began, as he sat down, and he, he meant to kind of teach his disciples, though there were others listening, this is really directed directly to the disciples who would one day become the apostles of the church, but it is definitely for us as part of the church. These promises and these statements are for the church. Hallelujah. But he begins in verse 3 and says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are spiritually poor are those who acknowledge their spiritual bankruptcy before a righteous and holy God. Now, this may kind of sound hard or maybe even harsh, but there is a reality that we have to come to that we are lost without the salvation of Christ Jesus that there's nothing that we can do to earn or merit salvation in Christ Jesus, and that's what the Lord is revealing to us here. We need to understand that salvation is totally and entirely a work of God. Hallelujah and amen. Paul reminds us of that in Colossians chapter 2, where he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. 
God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Hallelujah. This is the gospel. This is the salvation. But it requires someone who understands that we are spiritually poor before a Lord. We require outside intervention through the grace and mercy that's revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The apostles would proclaim this message and many of them would lose their life for the proclamation of that message. Jesus continues in verse four and says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. That mourning is the mourning, the reality of your sin. That there's a sorrow, a genuine sorrow for the sins that we commit on a regular basis. That's why I think that moment of silence, especially in Communion Sunday is so important. It's just not a time to try to remember what we forgot this morning or did we turn this light off or shut this door. It's a time to use the Ten Commandments the way that they're meant to be used for a believer in Christ Jesus. Because in Christ, those Ten Commandments move from our accusatory record of wrongs to ten ways in which we worship God in the freedom of Christ Jesus. In that declaration of not guilty, we go through the Ten Commandments. Thou should have no other gods before me. Do not take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not steal, do not, mo- do not murder, on down the list. Using those 10 commandments to remind us that we do sin. And even though we are forgiven, even though we do have salvation in Christ Jesus, we continue to embrace that life of confession and repentance. Paul also talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 where he says this, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. That mourning that is a part of repentance only lasts for a moment. Psalm 30, verse 5, reminds us of that reality. Though his anger is but for a moment, his favor, his, his unmerited grace is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning because God's grace and his mercy is new every single morning. Aren't you glad for that? I am. Because on a daily basis, I know that I sin. But there's a wonderful blessedness to confessing and repenting of that sin in the midst of the freedom of Christ Jesus. Jesus continues and says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That meek describes someone who is humble and teachable. Someone who understands the reality of our situation without Christ. The reality of our situation maybe before Christ that we have now become new creations in Christ Jesus, which we'll talk about in a moment. But as he talks about these three blessed qualities, poor in spirit, those who mourn over their sin, those who are teachable and humble, embracing that life of confession and repentance, look at the wonderful promise that Christ gives us at the end of verse five. They shall inherit the earth. In in, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verses one through seven, there's a snapshot of that to come where we will have a new heaven and a new earth and God will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away and behold, the new has come. God will place us in a reality where we will live in the presence of the triune God with no more pain, no more suffering, no more arguments, no more loneliness, no more grief over the loss of a loved one. A place where death is no more. Can anybody say hallelujah? Hallelujah. And that is the promise for those who are in Christ Jesus. The one who conquers will have this heritage. God will be their God and we will be his children for all eternity. This is the promise that we have in Christ Jesus. The next thing that Jesus reveals in his Beatitudes is this. Jesus describes the characteristics that God desires in those who are saved. Jesus describes the characteristics that God desires for us to have in our hearts and our minds for those who are saved. Let's look at verses six through eight. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When we are saved in Christ Jesus, when we are new creations in Christ Jesus, the presence and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit kind of changes what we crave. If you've ever been in my situation where you ran from God and you you kind of made choices that were really contrary to living a godly life like I did between the ages of 18 and 24, when you have that awakening, you're really aware that things change. When the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of you in the salvation of Christ, your desire changes. You no longer desire the things that you did back then. 
You start to hunger and thirst for the things of God, cultivating a desire to read and study and hear the word of God on a regular basis. It's simple, but it's not easy. There's sometimes we need to intentionally cultivate this. We need to kind of push through our feelings and maybe even somewhat of our depression sometimes. And we need to continually grow on our our dependence upon God and his holy word. Jesus continues and said, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. This describes someone who is saved, who has been declared not guilty, and then the mercy that they experience in Christ Jesus is then extended to other people. That we don't become judgmental in any way, shape, or form. That we don't try to sit and wag our finger at people because honestly what we deserve is what we confess on the other three weeks. We, we really do deserve God's temporary and eternal punishment because of our sin. But God has shown us mercy in Christ Jesus, and we too should pass that mercy along to other people, looking to help them and bring them back to the cross of Calvary. Verse 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That purity of heart that's described can only come from one place. The righteousness of Christ that we are clothed in upon our baptism, the righteousness of Christ that's credited to us, because our hearts are not pure. And I think if we're honest, we can see that. The purity of heart that he's describing comes from God and God alone and the power of the Holy Spirit. As we cling to those 10 commandments as test, 10 ways in which we worship God and the freedom of Christ Jesus, we embrace the purity that is described in those 10 commandments, not because we have to, but because we want to because of what Christ has done for us. It is an act of worship to a holy God to a savior who has truly paid it all. It is a way in which we worship God and allow that transforming presence and power to continually change us from one degree of glory to another, to be more and more like the person God desires and less and less like our sinful, selfish selves. Jesus continues in verse nine, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. The peace that he's talking about there is the peace that comes from the salvation of Christ. Sure, we should pray for and long for peace in this world, but quite frankly, it's going to come and go. There's always going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's always going to be some sort of catastrophe, natural disaster, or countries that are, that are fighting and warring against each other. It, it will always happen. It has from the beginning of time until now, and it will not stop. In fact, as we grow closer to the, the Lord's return, it will actually get worse. But the peacemakers are those who proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who proclaim that when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Because without that salvation, without the promise of eternal life, there really is no true peace. You might find peace and comfort in a new house or a new car for a while, but it'll be fleeting. Because everything falls down, everything is destroyed, everything over time decays. But the one thing that never loses its potency, one thing that never loses its purity is the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The salvation that we have in Christ Jesus never loses its strength. It never loses its purity and it never becomes dim or faded in any way. As we continually hear the promise of of the word of God, those who preach the gospel of Christ with and without words, living a life of obedience because we want to, As an act of worship, they shall be called the sons of God. That wonderful promise that we as ambassadors for Jesus Christ are representing our true homeland, God's eternal kingdom in a sinful and fallen land. That we don't belong to this world. Our home is not of this world. Hallelujah. And as sons and children of God, we participate in the laws of this land and we vote as we will on Tuesday using the Ten Commandments to guide us in our voting. We do all of this as an act of worship, but the most important thing that we need to adhere and cling on to and embrace in our life is to allow our lives to continually be transformed so that it proclaims the saving gospel of Jesus Christ with and without words. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Cling to these promises and embrace them as kind of our constitution for our life as believers in Christ Jesus because of our true home. 
The final thing that we see in our text is that Jesus reveals what a faithful believer can expect in this world. (laughs) Uh, This is not the fun part right here. This is what Jesus reveals that a faithful believer can expect in this world, but also the one to come. And so Jesus makes the the disciples known because he kind of shifts from blessed are those to now you. Uh, It goes from the third person to the second person. And he's directing this toward the future suffering of the apostles as they proclaim the gospel of Christ. The thing that's real about this text is we're going to experience that in some way, shape, or form too. Now, we aren't in the situation that they were in. But we're in a society and a world where Christianity is becoming the minority. Where the only faith that you can persecute and everybody thinks it's cute is Christianity. And that's not going to get any better anytime soon. Jesus says in verses 10 through 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. That word great is underlined and highlighted in every physical Bible I own. Because that's what keeps me going. Great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who who were before you. The thing about living for God, especially in the society that we're in now, with some of the growing division, some of the the, the moral failings of our society and, and how morality It's like good has been changed for bad and evil has been changed for good. And uh, it's described in scripture in 1 Timothy that this is going to happen. But I think all of us are just shocked at the incredible speed at which it's happening. And I, I know that we probably shouldn't be, but I think in some ways it's good for us to be shocked and appalled at some of these things. Some of the things that that I would have never have thought that people would embrace as a good thing that's absolutely evil and morally corrupt is just extraordinary to me. And so as we take a stand on the word of God and and what God prescribes for us as believers and what we embrace as, as part of what God prescribes for marriage, the family, and the family life, as we stand strong on those principles and those things as an act of worship from God, we will be persecuted. I've been called a Bible thumper. I've been called names I can't repeat and won't repeat as a pastor. And and you think that this was kind of a noble office, maybe even 20 years ago. But but there are many times where I get an earful when people find out what I do for a living. It's fascinating. Now, that happens a lot less out here. I'm just going to be honest with you. But in Minneapolis, it was a surprise. People wouldn't even wait on me when they found out what I did. It's fascinating. But it's there. And we shouldn't take that for granted. The freedoms that we have in this country, people died for those freedoms. We need to do all that we can to continually stand on the word of God and stand for the biblical view of marriage and family. Because if we don't, then then what are we? Are we the church then? Are we those who are standing strong on the word of God because we give in to the pressures of society? Is that really what Christ did? No, it's not. Is that what the apostles did? No, it, it wasn't. And this may be uncomfortable. I even talked to my confirmation students. I'm like, when you choose Christ, you're, you're going to receive a little bit of flack. When you say no to things that everybody else is doing, and you know those things are wrong, when you say no to that because you want to honor Christ in your faith, you will be persecuted. And I've used this story before, but I'm going to use it again because I I think about it even myself. As my son, um, my sons were going to school in Arlington, um, there was a a particular, I think it was for, it wasn't for Christmas, but it was a choir concert. And there were a few songs in there that my son, Eli, was very uncomfortable with. And so he asked the teacher, like, can I sit out? I don't want to sing this song because I don't believe in the message. And I was proud of him. And he got teased and he got ridiculed and he came home crying. And I remember that day very, very well. And as he came and he sat in my lap and as he's crying, he's telling me about his day. And I started to really show compassion for him at first. And I was so proud of him. And I know that it hurt. It hurts to be accused and to be bullied and to be teased. It hurts. It's a a real pain. 
But after a couple of the statements that he made, I started saying cha-ching. And he'd say another thing, and I'd say cha-ching. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> because he got a little irritated. And I said, I'm just repeating what Jesus says in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 5. He said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, let's read it. So we pulled out verses 10 through 12. And I said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. That's you, Eliah. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's your promise. Because you stood strong in the word of God. Blessed are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And that happened to him. And he's like, dad, this sounds like me. This like, sounds like the day that I just went through. And I go, you're right. And I said, now this is the one that, that becomes really important. I, we're supposed to rejoice in this. And he's like, why? Because Jesus says, great is your reward in heaven. As he continually got persecuted for standing on the word of God, he was banking it in heaven. Cha-ching. And I remember I used this analogy. I can't remember how long ago. And I had quite a few emails and texts from people saying, you know what? I said cha-ching a couple times under my breath this week. Thank you for sharing that analogy. So when we're persecuted for standing on the word of God, and when we're persecuted for standing on the truth of God's holy word, cha-ching, great is your reward in heaven. Amen? And that's what keeps us going. That's what gives us the courage to stand strong because there are so many people on this All Saints Day that went before us and did stand strong in the word of God. You may not be like the disciples, and I pray that that would never happen, that you would possibly lose your life or having to stand up, but I, I pray for myself that if I ever was in that situation, that I would willingly lose my life rather than forsake the gospel of Christ and the Savior that I serve. I pray for the courage that the apostles were given by the Holy Spirit. I pray for their steadfastness and their faithfulness, and I pray that for all of us too. Yes, we have some wonderful things in this life, and they are beautiful. But we need to continue to look to God. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for they shall inherit the earth. There is an inheritance that is beyond our wildest imagination. May we rest in that promise all the days of our life. Lord, I thank you for this text and this great reminder of these wonderful things, these attributes, these qualities that exist for those who can be saved and those who are saved, and then also those who endure to the end. May you encourage us, establish us, and preserve us according to your holy word and the power of your spirit. I thank you and I pray all these things in Christ's name and all of God's people said.